There are a lot of geopolitical events happening around the world right now. In my videos recently, I keep saying the same thing. The world is on fire. All the naysayers like to say the same thing, that these things have been happening for decades, that there's nothing new to see here. It's always hard to talk with people like that because they wear their ignorance like a crown. Yes, these events have been happening for a long time, specifically in Israel, but that means nothing about today. Let me ask you, have you ever seen a conflict like this between two people? Like they fight constantly all the time. Sometimes there's a gap between their beef, but it always keeps coming back. They actually fight so much that sometimes people on the outside are numb to it. But depending on how deep their conflict is, there is that one time where the conflict gets real and someone gets killed. Then the people on the outside say, I can't believe it happened. And they fall victim to guilt or blame because of their ignorance. That's exactly what the naysayers today are like. They want us to believe them when they say, nothing to see here. But they will be the same ones to be shocked when something deeper happens. And they will fall victim to it and be responsible for all the others they were influencing to not pay attention. Now, I like to be clear. I cannot see in the future. I am not speaking with assurance that this is the precise time where we will see the full agenda to this conflict actually be played out. I am not setting any dates and telling anyone that this will happen on this date. That's not this ministry. All I want to do is give some points of clarity away from the mainstream points of view. While I don't know for sure if this is the absolute point of no return in this conflict, what I do know for certain is that eventually we will get there and there are agendas surrounding it. So whether it is today, tomorrow, or years from now, a believer should have the right perspective surrounding this because it is crucial. If you're holding on to false ideals and perspectives, you may find yourself on a side you maybe shouldn't be on or attached to a problem that will lead you to a solution you're not supposed to accept. So regardless of what is happening in real time right now, the overall understanding of this conflict must be understood. Let's begin. Okay, so it's hard to know where to start in breaking this all down. Because depending on where you are in your understanding, there may be parts that your mind won't let you comprehend unless barriers are broken. What I will not do is start at today because there is so much information missing from this that it will be hard to really understand what is truly going on. I mean, I could just jump into the Balfour Declaration and then what happened after World War II, but that doesn't really give a full perspective and doesn't help get rid of already false ideals of who is involved we have to go a lot further back in time. Now, I think the best way to start this is with a question. This subject requires thought. Think about it. What happened to Israel after they crucified Yeshua all the way up to our modern times that we live in today? Now, I have covered the preliminary answer to this question in my History of Religion series after we finished the Book of Acts from part 58 to about part 61. We covered the basics, but we should definitely hold on to this history and focus on it after the fall of Jerusalem. In 70 AD, Jerusalem fell completely under Roman rule, and the Jews there were killed and many of them fled away. The temple of the Jews was destroyed, and they were no longer allowed to practice their beliefs of the one true God, Yahuwah. Please note, this was before Rome decided that they were going to intertwine themselves within the faith of the Jewish Messiah and create their own sect of the way. But look at this map. When Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, the Jews that escaped fled Roman rule. Now ask yourself, do you think they went north into Asia Minor where there was a strong Roman rule? Or do you think that they would more likely flee south away from Roman rule? The good news is that we don't have to rely on our own thoughts on this. History shows that there were many different Jew civilizations in Africa and what we call the Middle East. I covered this in part 58 and 59 of the History of Religion series. To be thorough, let's go back over that information. We'll start with the book by Flavius Josephus, who was a Roman Jewish historian who wrote The Jewish Wars. He shows 
how the prophecy of Yeshua about not one stone would be left on another came true. Not one stone of the temple was left standing after the war of 70 AD. The events of 66 to 73 AD brought untold suffering to thousands of Jews. The temple and sacrificial system were ended. The Roman governor appointed over Judea in 64 AD was Jesius Florus. He was said to be a corrupt and cruel man. After he raided the treasury of the temple in Jerusalem, the resentment of the Jews was at a boiling point. The Pharisees joined forces with a rejuvenated zealot movement in organizing a revolt. Herod Agrippa II, you remember him. He was the one that Paul appeared before years earlier in Acts chapter 26. He urged the Jews to be at peace, but he was rejected. He stayed loyal to Rome, not the Jews. A rebel leader named Menehem led a band of men to capture the Roman military fortress at Masada, near the Dead Sea. Then using the weapons from Masada, he went on to capture the Roman garrison in Jerusalem next to the temple. Menahem was killed in 66 AD. The early success of the rebels caused a revolution fever to spread throughout Judea. Many expected a complete victory, as in the days of the Maccabean revolt more than two centuries earlier. This was covered in part 13. Victory seemed to be guaranteed in November 66 AD, when the rebel Jews defeated a Roman legion sent from Syria. But this revolt was not led by the power of Elohim. Rome proved to be more powerful than those revolting against it. Nero sent his best general, Vespasian, with three legions from Rome to Judea. They arrived in Galilee in early 67 AD and began taking it down. Vespasian's forces began consolidating their gains and approached Jerusalem. The war was briefly interrupted by Nero's apparent suicide. Nero was declared an enemy of the people and was sentenced to be put to death. He killed himself before this happened. There was civil unrest in Rome after his death. Vespasian resumed his military offensive of Judea in June of 69 AD and took all of Judea except Jerusalem. He was proclaimed emperor and he left Judea to go back and take control of the complete Roman Empire. This time period is known as the year of the four emperors. In the spring of 70 AD, Vespasian sent his son Titus to crush the Jews. Titus had several Roman legions at his disposal. His troops laid siege to Jerusalem in April. The Jews were able to endure five months. The last animal sacrifice was offered on the great altar of the temple on August 6th. The temple was burned on August 28th, 70 AD. The destruction of the entire city soon followed and was made into heaps of rubble by the end of September. It is reported that after the fires cooled, the Roman troops literally pried apart the stonework of the temple in order to retrieve the gold that had melted between the cracks. This was a fulfillment of Yeshua's prophecy in Matthew chapter 24. The Romans then proceeded to subdue the three remaining rebel fortresses. The last one was Masada, which fell in May of 73 AD, after its defenders committed mass suicide. The Romans ruled Judea with an iron fist, treating it as occupied hostile territory. After the loss of the temple, everything changed for the Jews. They had no way to properly worship Yahuwah. The Sadducees and the priesthood disappeared as factors in society. The Pharisees dominated the belief and a new Sanhedrin, which is an assembly of appointed rabbis, was established. And they mainly functioned as an institution to study the scriptures. The synagogues continued to be the institution by which the religion of the Jews was sustained. There was no tolerance of the Christian movement within the Jews any longer. The Jews were without a temple, and by rejecting the message of Yeshua, they had become a religion without its heart and soul. They were no longer the stewards of Elohim's kingdom. Their history gets bleaker and worse as the centuries continue all the way until this present day. This is not speaking of the current occupants of the land of Israel today. What happened to Israel is all a confirmation of the curses found in Deuteronomy chapter 28. 
This was the time period referred to as the first Jewish revolt. Now, it is said that Emperor Vespasian issued an order that to ensure that no member of the royal house should be left among the Jews, all descendants of David should be vetted out. And this resulted in a further widespread persecution of the Jews. He ordered the execution of all who were of David's line. And that's a lot of important history to hold to. Now, let's keep discussing the Jews after their revolts. For much of this information, I'll be using the research conducted by Rudolf Windsor in his book, From Babylon to Timbuktu. This is tremendous information that should be included in your studies. After the first Jewish revolt, that was not the complete end to the turbulence for the Jews, but it was a major turning point for them. The Hebrews before that time were allowed by Rome to be their own sect of religion and worship their God without interference. After the first Jewish war, that all changed. They never again enjoyed the support they had from Rome. Because of this, there was consistent fighting and rebellion against Rome by the Hebrews. If you want to research this on your own, you can look for the Jewish wars during the time period of 66 AD to 136 AD. The Hebrews revolt developed into full-scale fighting and in the year 132 AD, we have what is called the Second Jewish Revolt. Tinius Rufus was the Roman governor of Judea at the time. Jerusalem was still in ruins after the first Jewish revolt that led to the destruction of the temple. Emperor Hadrian at the time wanted to rebuild Jerusalem as a Roman colony. He wanted to assimilate Jerusalem with Rome's already traditional pagan culture. So he dealt harshly with the Hebrews there. He placed many restrictions on their way of life, like banning circumcisions. This eventually led to a revolt by the Hebrews, led by Simon Bar Kokhba. These Jews were crushed by the Romans, and Emperor Hadrian wiped the province of Judea off the Roman map, renaming it Syria Palestina. He renamed Jerusalem Elia Capitolina after himself and rebuilt it as a typical Roman town. It would be this way until the 7th century when the Arabs conquered the city. I'll get to that though. After this, thousands of Jews migrated to Egypt and Arabia. The persecutions and restrictions imposed on the Jews were so great that a large number of Jews fled into Arabia. During the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries, Judaism was politically powerful in Arabia. This power was predicated around trade. There were many Jew kings. We had Abu Kariba, Masruk Abraha, and most notably, Du Nuwas. Yemen at one time was a stronghold of Jewish kings. By the early part of the 6th century AD, Jewish power in Yemen reached its height. This was the time of the golden age of the black Jews in Yemen never to be achieved again. They were conducting international trade of commodities with the East and West. During that time, there was a number of Arab converts to Judaism that intermarried with the original Jews. Du Nuas was one of these Arabs who converted to Judaism. He was the king of Yemen around 500 AD. The Jewish sages, also known as scholars, were invited to teach Judaism to the people in Yemen at large. When Du Nuas heard that the Jews were being persecuted in the Byzantine Empire, he retaliated by killing some Byzantine merchants and 20,000 Christians in Arabia. This act brought about the fall of the Jewish kingdom in Arabia. You must understand that the power of Israel was not destined to be used in the world in that way. As it is prophesied to Zerubbabel in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahuwah of hosts. Israel's power comes from Yahuwah, not by our flesh. So it's important now to understand, because this information is really hidden from us. Before the rise of Islam in the Middle East, there was a mix of pagans, Christians from Rome, and like I just explained, the Jews who fled. History leaves this information out for multiple obvious reasons. But it's very important to understand this history if you want to understand what is happening in the present. 
At the time of the birth of Muhammad, the Roman Empire was divided into two parts. The Western Empire with the capital at Rome and the Byzantine Empire with the capital at Constantinople. Many different influences weakened both of these empires by this time, which gave way for a new power. The Arabian Empire, with its new religion of Islam, established itself on the ruins of the Roman Empire in the Middle East, Africa, and the parts of Europe. Europe remained dormant and inactive during the period that we know as the Dark Ages, while the Muslim Empire grew in dominant influence. When Muhammad was born, many Arabs were still worshipping the sun, the stars, spirits, and idols. It's said that the Arabs possessed 360 idols, one for each day of the year. Muhammad was born 570 AD. Now, I do go more in depth with the birth of Islam in part 64 of the history of religion. I will not dwell on it in this video for time purposes. Muhammad, who spent many days in the hills outside of Mecca, wanted to lead his people away from the idolatry. He believed that he was commissioned by the angel Gabriel and believed he was a prophet. In the History of Religion series, the truth of this was exposed. But either way, he went out to the holy temple to preach to the multitudes with the words that started the first phase of the Islamic revolution. Those words were, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. At that time, due to the Hebrews' influence in the region, the Torah was already being translated into Arabic, and the Arabs were delighted and pleased to read about their great ancestors in the story of the Hebrew patriarchs. We have been so trained to ignore that there was an influence of Jews during the early part of modern history. We speak so much of Rome and the Christians, but the Jews were also known there. They just held pockets of power that were eventually overthrown. They used their talents to form influence, but never were able to become a nation again, even to this day. But like I explained, the Arabs were influenced by the Jews that were there, and the reading of the Torah for them, again, brought them great pride as it does today, when they read things like Ishmael was to become a great nation. That's why it is so easy for Muslims to feel so comfortable with the Bible and feel like the history is shared. But let's not get caught up in that just yet. Let's get back to Muhammad. Muhammad masterminded the first stage of his revolution by undermining and discrediting already established beliefs and customs and questioning other political, social, and religious institutions. When he returned to the city of Mecca, the opposition intensified against him. A law was enacted that anybody who accepted Islam would be exiled. Leaders of Mecca conspired to assassinate him. This motivated him to flee from Mecca to Yathrib, later called Medina, the city of the Prophet. This flight is known as the Hegira. In Medina, Muhammad found the inhabitants there were more hospitable to him and his new religion. One factor that contributed to this was that there were many influential Jews there in Yathrib, Medina, who were allies with other Arabs. And of course, these Jews introduced the conception of one God. The Arabs at that time before Muhammad's rise were somewhat tolerant of the Jews. Either way, the Arabs were ready to accept Islam because they were influenced to a great extent by the concept of the one God of the Jews. Eventually, Muhammad was proclaimed ruler of the city of Yathrib. And in his honor, the name of Yathrib was changed to Medina. Now, in the creation of Islam, Muhammad adopted many principles and laws from the belief of the Jews, from the Torah. First and the biggest of all, the main idea of monotheism. This was the belief in only one God, and this is the belief that only Israel held. Muhammad also adopted the main details of the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement, the Sabbath, and many other parts of the Torah. And Muhammad even sought to convert the Jews in Arabia to Islam, but this did not occur. So this transformed the high esteem that Muhammad held for the Jews to enmity, and instead of allies, he looked at them as competitors. You see, he needed the confirmation of the influential Jews to validate his mission. And being that he did not receive it, he turned against the Jews and became their tormentor. 
Muhammad tried to construct his religion as closely as he could to the belief of the Jews by accepting many of the laws and traditions. But when the Jews refused to convert, he commanded his followers to stop turning to the holy city of Jerusalem in prayer, or rather to the city of Mecca. He changed the Jews' day of atonement and started the month of Ramadan. He changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Friday. Now, to gain the loyalty of the pagan Arabs, just as the Romans did with their pagans, Muhammad adopted many of their most loved customs. The Kaaba stone was to receive high regard in their new religion. Also, the pagan temple at Mecca was to remain as a holy site. From this, Islam spread amongst the Arab tribes. It is very important to understand that Muslims are not worshipping the same God of the Hebrews. The similarities in these beliefs come from assimilation, just like the Roman Catholic Church did. It was not authentic, like as the Bible speaks of with the history of the Hebrews. The Torah was given by Father, Yahuwah, not made by man. Yahuwah spoke directly to them and commanded them with a lot of history and prophecy. No other belief is likened to this, though it is obviously continuously tried. This confusion is able to happen due to ignorance and lack of knowledge and understanding. It's when people look at the surface without digging any deeper. Like in reference to Jesus. There are many references to Jesus in the Quran. Muslims honestly believe the Jesus of the Bible is the same as their Jesus in the Quran, which is another reason why I love using his Hebrew name, because it takes away from that confusion. Yes, in their holy book of the Quran, they speak many times about Jesus. But in part 65, I break down specifically the difference between the Jesus of the Bible versus the Jesus of the Quran. They are not speaking of the same Messiah that was sent to the Hebrews. They are just using the same name. But in understanding this all in full, you can see why there is so much confusion in the world, because it's not often spoken of how much influence the Hebrews had on the religion of Islam. And as we go into our modern history, with much of our past history stripped and taken and withheld from us, given to us in small doses mixed with confusion, it's easy to see how people will believe that all religions and beliefs are the same, believing that they are all one serving the same God. This is because there is such a lack of understanding of history. But let's keep going. In the second stage of Muhammad's Islamic revolution, after all his means of persuasion to convert did not work, he sent a sword. He became a martial prophet and the pagans and the stubborn Jews became his victims. One instance, for example, was at the Battle of the Foss in the year 627. This is when Jewish tribes were defeated by the armies of Muhammad. 700 Jews were gathered in the marketplace and offered the alternative, the Quran or the sword. But the devout Jews were accustomed to martyrdom. They did not hesitate in their choice and were executed. After the death of Muhammad, there was a rapid spread of Islam in the area of what we now call the Middle East. The Jews fled this area and went south into what we now call Africa. There was much more information that could be provided on this, but to show some proof of this, let's look at this map of Africa made by Iman Bowen in the 17th century. First off, this area is called Negroland, which says a lot. But if we look deeper, we can see where they took the slaves from right on the slave coast, which was labeled what? Yes, you see it, Kingdom of Judah. You must understand, they scattered and they tried to keep their customs, but they were not living in their land and were not under the blessings, but the curses of the Most High. And they were betrayed by the other inhabitants of that land that did not share their customs, and they were captured and then given to the slave traders. I keep this map framed in my home because it is always a reminder that they knew who they were taking when they took their slaves. It was never random like they want us to believe. This was all according to the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28. I speak on this in more depth in my racism part two video, the blessings and curses of the Israelites. If you have not watched that video, please do so next. People want to deny this because the information today has been so compounded with false information. But this is why this history has been kept and not made clear at all 
even though we were given such long educations. I know that this information may be hard to swallow for those holding on to the world's narrative of things. And that's why they keep this information hidden from us. Because when you understand this history, you then go forward to today and then ask yourself then, who are the inhabitants of Israel today? So this brings us to the real purpose of the video and let's tie it all into modern day Palestine and Israel. Now, I do apologize. In all my years of making videos, I have never done this, but I have split up this video. To control the biases and worldly persecution around this topic, the rest of this information I have placed in a separate video named part two. I have uploaded this video directly to my website, truthunedited.com. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but in order to protect this ministry, this is what I was led to do. This next information is vital. If you would like to know more and continue with the video, please go directly to my website at truthunedited.com. The link to that video is in the description box of this video. Thank you for your support and your understanding. I love you all.